Criminoids. 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 Okay, hello, Leslie. We hello. have uh, Leslie Loco. Leslie Loco is an architect, academic, and novelist. And my first question is going to be, are you human? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very much. <laughs> and after this exhibition, do you think that you are human? Yes, still very definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. In your project, uh, uh, in this uh, Istanbul Design Biennial, uh, your project deals with the constitution of geography in one of the more in the world's most contested places, South Africa. Could you uh, talk a little bit about your project and uh, these implications, and uh, specifically about the geographical uh, implications of your project? Yeah. Please? Well, the project takes place um, literally in a site that's about 60 kilometers north of Johannesburg. And it's an area called the Cradle of Humankind, according to UNESCO. But in the local language, it's a place called Maropeng, which means returning to the place of origin. And it's a site that has yielded up the most um, number of early humanoid um, fossils. And about two years ago, there was quite a dramatic discovery made of a fossil, a collection of fossils, which were found later to be a new species of proto-human. And there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of controversy about this particular finding because one of the reasons why the cavers who stumbled across the bones were convinced that they'd stumbled across a species related to Homo sapiens was because the bones had been placed there deliberately. So it was a kind of act of design, if you like. And this is something that caught the popular imagination. There's a lot of debate in the paleon anthropological community as to whether this was true or not. But the, the idea of this site yielding up our kind of ancestors was, was very potent for us. And particularly in South Africa, because the question of human for most Africans has been a really slippery, politically sensitive, um, long historical question. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, this was a very loaded site to work with and a very loaded set of ideas. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's not dealing, as uh, you were saying, not dealing only with uh, geography or with location, but also with temporalities. It's extremely challenging in these temporalities, no? Because they are all, uh, in a way, like, in a kind of a layer cake or something like that. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, the question of history in a, in a place like um, South Africa, and particularly in this project, where we were dealing with things that had happened two million years ago with the kind of impact of the Frieda Fort's um, a meteorite which forced the gold to the surface, which in the end became the reason for the founding of Johannesburg, but also this kind of successive layers of immigration into the area has, has set up all kinds of tensions around who owns what, who has the right to, to be there, who has the right to be called human, whose language takes precedence. So it's been a very, um, it's been a very difficult um, terrain to work in because of the sensitivities around ownership of all of those kinds of ideas but also, I think, a really necessary one. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, also yesterday in your intervention in one of the panels, uh, you were talking also about the um, meaning of uh, narratives, in a way, and uh, how narratives are delivering some very specific uh, political issues, no? Mm -hmm. Or that they could uh, actually like uh, address some political issues that are not capable just like to uh, speak of in some other ways, no? In some other... Yeah, and I mean, I think it's been very interesting. I'm, I'm back in academia now after a, quite a long spell out. And what's been very interesting teaching a, a new generation of South African students, particularly students of all races, all kind of backgrounds, is that the idea of narrative allowing each person, in a sense, to tell their story, but to tell their story through different means, so not just through words or through written text, but to tell it through film, through drawings, through a different kind of medium, I think has been really interesting. Uh, very challenging on the one hand, but also very liberating. And I mean, I think, again, in a place where the, the, the kind of question of who belongs here, who has the right to speak on behalf of, has made even the act of narrative a very political one. So if you were to look at the Kosa narrative of this area, it would be a very, very different one from the Dutch, very different from the Afrikaner, very different from the English. And somehow all of those narratives have to coexist simultaneously. So this has made us think anew about the, the question of who has the right to write, in a way. Yeah. 
and even these media are uh, building up another kind of different body. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think we are finding the, the conventional tools of sort of architectural representation, whether that's drawings, texts, um, sort of normative ways of expressing architecture are no longer valid in a sense. And that's partly why this conversation around design has opened up really immense territories for us about finding new ways to express things that could never be said. And I think one of the things that's been very, particularly very difficult for, for African architects, if, if you like, or African artists in the widest sense of the word, is that at the same time you're trying to explore something, you're having to explain it to everybody. So in a sense, you're performing your Africanness for an audience that is not from there. So this, um, we spoke yesterday about being in a kind of milieu of design, I think is a really important, it's an important idea for us. And it also opens the idea of uh, uh, the performative aspect of architecture. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, I think the, the way that, um, well, the, the clearest example I can give of this um, is maybe 20, 25 years ago, going with a group of students to northern Zimbabwe and coming across a, a village that had been earmarked for development. So people had been moved out of the old kind of Rondavo living quarters and into new homes that had been designed by planners. And they were the kind of bog standard, you know, typical home, two windows, a door, a tin roof. And in this particular village, many of the men work on the mines in South Africa, so they leave every year, and then they come back after two or three years, and as writers have said, they procreate the next generation of miners. And in one particular instance, a miner had come back after about six or seven years he'd been absent to find that his wife that he'd left behind had moved on. She'd found someone else and had children. And he, he killed her. It was, a, it was quite a sensational murder. And one of the elders in the village was saying that if he had come back to the old arrangement of the huts. He would have come first to his mother's hut, then to his father's, only then to the wife. And so this kind of social arrangement would have given people a chance to explain to him what had happened. But he'd moved into this kind of very Western style building arrangement and he'd gone straight to the house of his wife, found her with someone else and killed her. And for me, it was a very interesting example of how we replace these old patterns of living, of making that have very, very deep social relations and we don't find a new space for those in kind of contemporary urban settings mm -hmm. and this is this sort of clash if you like between rural and traditional and modern and urban is a really interesting one in Africa all mm -hmm. over. Okay. My last question would be like what are we going to see in your uh, project? What are we going to see just like in even like in material terms? I mean, many different things. We've been working with projection, but one of the things that I find most moving in the installation are these 3D um, models, 3D printed models of the bones of Homo Naledi. And when we first were taken into the archives at uh, the University of Fitzwaterstrand to see the bones, it reminded me very much of going to see Mark Wallenberg's Statue of Christ in um, Trafalgar Square. I think he, on the fourth plinth, he had made a, a kind of life-size cast of Christ. Mm. And I remember looking up at it and realizing, actually, this is a man-sized image. Like, it was somehow, you know, you're so used to seeing this image as something that's bigger than you. And when we saw the bones of Homo Naledi, they're sort of, you know, 75% the size of us. Mm -hmm. And this was a very poignant moment. So for me, that's one of the most interesting things about that exhibition is not so much the geography and the interior of the cave, but it's these fragments of things that are so connected to us, mm -hmm. but, but so far away. Mm -hmm. Okay, many thanks. Thank you. <laughs>